Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this month's episode of the Vanderbilt University School of Engineering Graduate Program Conversation Hour. Uh, this month, it is a pleasure to welcome our graduate student ambassadors from the Computer Science Program here in our School of Engineering. Um, so just want to give everybody a brief introduction before we get started. So my name is Gabriel Luis. Um, I am the Director of Graduate Recruitment for the School of Engineering here at Vanderbilt, and I will be hosting tonight's uh, session with our panelists. Uh, so before we begin and get into all these really cool questions, I want to first have everybody um, do a, just a brief self-introduction. So if you can just tell us your name, um, maybe a fun fact about yourself, and then the um, just a, uh, in the, uh, the area of research that you're working on in computer science uh, in your degree program, that'll be great. And then from there, we'll get into more uh, detailed questions. So first off, um, let's go ahead and start with James. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is James Anderson. I'm a fifth year PhD student, computer science. At, um, my research is in artificial intelligence, using artificial intelligence to understand human reasoning on visual problems. So that's what I do. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Castor, you're next. Oh, okay. So um, hi, everyone. My name is Kasthur. I'm a first year master's student. My area of interest for my research is ethical artificial intelligence. And I know you said fun fact. So a fun fact about me is that I started taking a boxing and I really like it. Super fun. Nice. That's actually, that's actually really neat. Um, wh where do you go boxing by the way? Like just curious. Oh yeah, no, there's a, there's a tidal gym that's nearby where I live. It's like a two minute walk literally down the street. So. It was so close that I decided I want to give it a shot. So I really like it. It's super fun. All right. Well, that's like, yeah, that's actually really neat. Um, so Castor, thank you so much for the intro. And Haley, you're next. Perfect. So hi, Haley Adams. Um, so my lab works with virtual and augmented reality. Um, and I, I actually look at um, human perception in augmented reality. So it's pretty interdisciplinary, even though I'm in computer science. And we use human perception to better inform the design of immersive like AR and VR headsets, which is fun. Uh, my fun fact is, I, don't, I still don't know if this is how relevant this fun fact is anymore, but I am incredibly good at Dance Dance Revolution. Got it <laughs> in like middle school and I could challenge anyone here and defeat you. Um, also, James and I started at the same time, and James, I didn't hear a fun fact, so I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So I think one fun fact. Um, I collect vintage cameras. I think that's the only cool thing about me. <laughs> that, that's actually, yeah, there's a lot of really fascinating things, that, and, and that's good. Like, it's great to have, like, so much, not only just diversity in, like, thought, but also just, you know, just hobbies as well. So mm. I think there's there's... We could have like a whole separate session just dedicated to our hobbies and, <laughs> and that's probably some stuff that's that's those are things prospective students want to learn about too so mm -hmm. we could definitely we can look into that um so next up zach would you like to do your uh self intro sure uh hi i'm zach stobner um i'm a master's student and my research is in applied machine learning for medical and neuroscientific data so i work with brain mri um mainly and fMRI and EEG and stuff like that. Um, fun fact about me is that I have two cats who are making a lot of noise in the background right now. And so they might be popping up and making little cameos. They love to annoy me when I'm on call. So I think I just heard one. I, I just heard them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now they're being heard throughout the entire internet all over the world. Now. So they are now internet sensations. Great. Wonderful. Um, Michael, you're next. Thanks, Gabriel. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Sanborn. I'm a second year PhD student, and I focus on mainly on cyber physical systems with a focus on security. And a uh, fun fact, I like to spend a lot of time outside and I like to rock climb. Great, wonderful. So um, first of all, I uh, want to first welcome our panelists. So welcome to tonight's event. Um, and so for the first question that I want to, um, to present to everyone here and feel free just to jump in and answer, um, as you see fit. Um, so the first question is, and it's neat because the dynamics of the session, we don't only have PhD students, but we also have master's students as well. So we're going to get a lot of really cool different perspectives in tonight's conversation. Um, so first question, why did you like, what was it about graduate school that made you want to, first of all, like apply 
and why did you choose Vanderbilt? So in other words, why graduate school? Why Vanderbilt? Feel free to jump in, whoever would like to start. Okay, I, I think I'll go first. So I think um, graduate school, I had, after completing my undergraduate studies, I worked for about six years in the industry and I wasn't enjoying it. So I wanted to go back to school primarily because I want to be a faculty member someday. I mean, that was my, that'd be my career goal all along. So it was just for me to pursue my careers. But I think I chose Vanderbilt mainly because of my advisor. I liked the work she was doing and it was a reason why I came to Vanderbilt. She's so cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, my advisor is Maithili Kunda. She's very cool, really cool. <laughs> oh, she's my advisor too. Oh, she's oh, awesome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Fun fact. No, um... That's a great way. Kastur, you want to tell us? Like, <laughs> great segue right there. <laughs> no, uh, for me, I wanted to come to graduate school. And if I am looking to the side, I have the stream up here, but my camera's over here. So, hi, everyone. But um, I wanted to come to graduate school because I wanted more time in academia. I actually recently graduated with my undergraduate degree. So um, that this past June, I got my bachelor's in computer science. And I was thinking, um, you know, I really want the opportunity to pursue something that I'm really interested in. And that for me was ethical AI. And the path to do that was, well, why not go to grad school and find some opportunities there? So that's why I chose to go to grad school. Why I chose Vanderbilt was because, well, I was really interested in what the faculty here was doing. There seemed like there was a lot of faculty that was kind of in an area tangential to what I wanted to do. So that's ended up being my main reason. Also, I really wanted to come to Nashville. I did apply to uh, Vanderbilt as my undergrad because it was also in Nashville. So it's a great city and I'm super happy to be here. Yeah, that's a good point. Like Location is important. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I, th I feel like everyone, yeah, there's always uh, multiple reasons. Um, one of my reasons was, uh, and so maybe some people in the audience are in the same situation. Um, I went to a liberal arts school that like barely had a CS program. Um, and I realized when I was going to graduate that there were really only particular jobs I was really trained and ready for. Um, so in that sense, grad school really rang as a good option because I could do more technical problems and I could dive deeper into more niche areas, which I actually love, um, but also got some research experience in undergrad, realized I really liked it, had a mentor that did research, and she really pushed for me to try out grad school and that it just kind of all the um, stars kind of aligned and I ended up where I am today and I love this field. Um, as far as Vanderbilt, um, that mentor is also a big reason that I'm here. Um, also, kind of like Custor, I definitely applied for some schools in colder locations and realized <laughs> I don't know if I can handle six months of winter. <laughs> that is a fair point. You're going to live in grad school, especially if you do a PhD for a long time. Yeah, I can jump in going off of Haley. I think uh, I was at Vanderbilt for my undergrad and uh, I kind of knew from the beginning that it was it was just a place that I wanted to be. I think starting out, I noticed something about the engineering school, just giving you exposure to uh, kind of three different disciplines of your choosing. And by the time I got to undergrad, I was, or to the end of my undergrad, I should say, I was getting into some courses that I was really interested in. And I kind of just happened upon who who a professor who was doing some interesting research and i had the opportunity to work with him towards the end of my undergraduate career and and he's my advisor today so um a little bit of the same as as haley but I, i'm really enjoying it so far um yeah quick question before i go is my video uh frozen on y'all screen no, no you're good yeah no, it's frozen can see fine, but Okay, awesome. Um, so similar to Mike, I so the reason I went to, to Vandy and the reason I went to grad school, I graduated from Vandy in May 2021, so not too long ago. Um, I started taking master's courses in my final year, and I realized a little late that I wanted to go into research and into academia. So I just it made sense for me to stay an extra year and get a little bit more research experience. Um, and finish out the master's and apply to PhDs this year. So that's what I'm doing now. And that's why I chose graduate school and why I chose Vandy. 
All right, wonderful. Thanks for sharing that information. Um, and before we move on to the next question, I just want to let all of our viewers know that um, so there was a sign up form that was just sent out into the different chat groups. So if you haven't registered for tonight's event, please do so because what that will do is it'll have it so that um, you'll be able to show up in our system. We'll get to learn a little bit more about you. And then following today's session, I'll be able to follow up with you afterwards when it comes to um, uh, you know, talking to you more about the application process and about applying to our program. So please feel free to fill that out and we'll have your information there. And you also see that my email address is also right by my name. So feel free to also send me an email uh, following today's session. Um, and then also just for our panelists, so we um, can actually receive questions in the chat box that we have right here. So you'll see that on the right hand side. So for all of our viewers at any point in time of today's discussion, please feel free to send us your questions and we will answer as many as we can um, uh, throughout the session. So please feel free to do that throughout today's session. All right, next question. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the application process in the sense that what do you think made your application stand out in the sense of you know your own background, what your preparation entailed, and what are some tips that maybe you could offer our viewers out there in terms of you know how to go about the application? I'll go ahead and start because I did do my application stuff literally last year. So it's the, the memory is still kind of fresh. But um, I think I'm going to start with tips. And the first tip that I have is to manage your time very well when you're doing applications. Because, you know, you're in your senior year of college, you're about to graduate, and you're still taking your courses, you know, you're trying to figure out what am I going to do. So if you do you end up choosing to go to graduate school, highly indoors, super fun. But make sure that you schedule your time well so that you're balancing your classwork along with, you know, the application process. In the application, what you're looking at is, you know, getting your letters of recommendation. You want to brush up your resume. You want to write your, uh, your essay, which is super important. So make sure that you schedule your time well enough that you can kind of write a couple of rough drafts, run it by a couple people, you know, have your, your professors, your friends, you know, your parents, throw at anyone, whoever can lay their eyes on and give you some feedback, make sure you get some time to do that. So that's like my one biggest tip about the application process. So uh, that's my one thing. What I feel made my application stand out, I think it was the way that I wrote about, you know, what I'm really interested in which is what I did for my, my personal statement. Um, ethical AI is something that I'm really, really interested in and I really do want to pursue. So I try to emphasize, you know, this is how I see this going in the future. And this is why I want to be a big part of this. So for something that I think is super important, give me the chance to do some work in it. So I think passion is something that really comes through in your essays. So it's really important to try and convey that. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'll, well. I'll go next. <laughs> so I think um, in my case, uh, I think one tip I'll give us to full from Castor statements, I think you should manage your time very well. The deadlines come very quickly. But I mean, it was a long time ago, so I really don't remember mine. I think our time was, I don't know, I, don't, I really don't remember much about it. But one thing I think makes, uh, made me stand out was we're writing samples that I attached to my application. So um, I had been out of school for a very long time, so I didn't, I couldn't even get faculty recommendations. So that made my thing a little difficult. So all my recommendations had to come from my employers at the time, like people I had worked with. So my application was way out of, like I didn't get any academic recommendations, let me put it that way. So I also didn't have any research, like any solid research background. But what I decided to do was I took some projects and wrote some papers, although they were unpublished, and I attached it to my application package. And my advisor told me that was what she saw and she really liked it. So she enjoyed reading the paper and she contacted me about the paper. And through that, we started a conversation and I ended up at Vanderbilt. So um, I mean, Haley will tell you, all, all the grad students will tell you that writing is the currency. So if you can show the faculty members upfront that you can write and you can express your ideas very well through your application package, it makes you stand out. That's so true. <laughs> uh, also, James, that's really cool. I don't know if we've talked about that before. Yeah. Um, 
my my I feel like application process was pretty um, standard in, in comparison. Um, I definitely I had some undergrad experience that undergrad mentor I mentioned previously really vouched for me. And um, so she wrote really nice letters of recommendation. Um, and then I'd had work or prior experience working with her and was able to meet some people in uh, academia to even uh, apply for. Uh, so in that sense, research experience can be very impactful. Strong letters of rec can be very impactful. Writing, oh my goodness. Wow, if you're a good writer, you're gonna have a, a you write so much more than they advertise in grad school, <laughs> or at least for PhDs. Masters might be able. You, you probably have to write a thesis, though. So I don't think you escape yeah. either. That's if you choose the thesis option. <laughs> <laughs> also, I just noticed Julie Adams said hi, hi, Dr. Adams. Hoping to catch up to you soon. I'm trying to graduate. So Julie Adams was faculty at Vanderbilt, and she's now at Oregon. Um, so hi, she's very cool. I think uh, I would say in my case, um, kind of similar to James only in that I didn't really have prior research experience. Um, and I also kind of had a general idea of what I was interested in, uh, but I would encourage prospective students to kind of cast a wide net, meaning like really think about what you're interested in and for the schools that you're interested in, kind of really try to understand what the kind of work the professors are doing and, and try to write, um, like we've all kind of emphasized writing is is really everything kind of like your ability to to uh, explain clearly your thoughts and and kind of convey your interests i think uh, will take you very far um in terms of i guess what maybe helped my application stand out it wasn't really anything that i had produced but maybe more experientially i was a student athlete during my undergrad and i think that kind of helped maybe like foster the kind of discipline and time management and maybe like kind of the collaborative skills that um, you may need or probably do need in, in grad school, depending on your field. Um, but that's um, maybe a little bit about my application process. And yeah, for me, um, I only applied to Vandy for the master's. Um, I've been talking about it with my advisor pretty early on. Um, like a couple of years. And I think that what helped me was having some tangible research experience for, although I didn't have, I only had a couple of projects that I'd worked on, but I did have results and things I could talk about and discuss in my application. And I had a very clear goal of like the research that I wanted to do in my master's and who I wanted to work with. And I think being able to like alliterate that in my writing um, helps, you know, make it a pretty easy decision um, for me, for my reviewers, hopefully. Um, yeah. Ooh, I feel like uh, our conversations have reminded me of something that for like general grad school applications, each university can take a different approach also. So at least I know when I applied for Vanderbilt, they very much had um, you consider particular people to work with even before you came to visit. Mm -hmm. Um, now, some other universities might do more broad rotations, for example, your first year if it was a PhD program, um, whereas I think Vanderbilt from the get-go is very much more directed. So yeah. always keep in mind what you want um, when you're applying. Oh, yeah. No, that's a really great point. That's something that I, you said it, and I just remembered it. Almost all of the schools that I had applied to, and I applied to uh, quite a few, they all said, which, who in the faculty are you interested in working with? So do your research about the programs, for sure. Um, sometimes it might help to like maybe read an abstract of a paper that a professor has published, you know, that might kind of influence your decision if, you know, is this someone that I want to work with, you know, or is there any other faculty that I might know about? One thing that'll never hurt is maybe emailing the professor. If they have the time, uh, they might just respond to you, then you can get like a conversation going and that might also help because then, you know, you have at least one contact at the university already. So it's, that's, that's one of those like low risk, high reward kind of things. Yeah, 10 out of 10 would recommend um, that. Also, you might email them and find out they're retiring so they are not taking on to <laughs> So, like, save yourself time. Yes, no, you made excellent points. Thank you for sharing that information. Um, 
Okay, so let's jump to the next question then. So the next question is, um, tell us a little bit about the research you're involved in. In other words, go into depth about the research you're doing. And then also, you know, Vanderbilt is a place where, you know, you have small class sizes, you have a lot of opportunities to work cross campus within different types of research institutes when it comes to being able to really utilize the resources on campus. Can you, and so when you're telling us about your research, also feel free to mention the research institutes that you're also involved in, who you work with and collaborate with. And just to kind of give us an idea of how does all that come together when it comes to doing, you know, cross disciplinary research and how does that look at Vanderbilt? Um, so yes, go ahead and jump in. I can start. Okay, so I think in my research, as I said earlier, I do work on visual spatial reasoning in humans. So specifically, what I'm doing for my dissertation now is using a technique known as program synthesis to build artificial agents that reason through specific visual reasoning tasks. So what that means is that we have special tasks. Um, the block design task is another one called the arc task. These are like special, like special visual tasks. And they are standardized tasks that are usually part of um, your standard IQ tests. So they are tests that humans take. And what we do is that we are building these program synthesis agents. So with program synthesis, the we don't write the code for the agent ourselves. The the AI system writes its own code, like it builds, it synthesizes its own program based on what it sees to solve the problem. And the idea here is we are looking at these programs as strategies and trying to understand what affects the diversity of strategies that agents will form. So how will these um, what environmental conditions like gaze shift? We, we factor all those things because it's visual reasoning. We, we are using gaze. We, ha we have motor actions and some of the tasks that we are studying are physical tasks. So you have blocks, so you need to build in affordances, which is like how the agents can interact with those blocks and pick them up and rotate them. But all this is done virtually. But what what my interest in for my much of my work is understanding how these strategies can be built using program synthesis. And um, by using program synthesis, we get AI models too that you can inspect because most traditional AI systems, like AI models, like neural networks and deep learning systems are black boxes that are very difficult to understand what's going on in there. But with program synthesis, you have a program that is code that is written and you can read it and you can understand what the system is doing. So you can, you can properly um, explain the strategy that the AI system is forming to solve the problems. Uh, in terms of um, cross, like there's a lot of cross work going on. So I work with, there's the first center for autism because most of the tasks that we work on are um, like the, the, the tasks that we use are intelligence tests that are usually given to autistic individuals. And so we, and autistic individuals perform very well on visual reasoning tasks. So in a way, you know, we try to, see how best we could use these as, as, a, as a means of evaluating individuals for like job performances and things like that, like non-traditional forms of evaluation. Because traditional forms of evaluation are usually like verbal and intimidating to certain people. So I work with the Free Center for Autism partially with that. And I'm also part of the, so there's a neuroscience inspired science and engineering cohort, which is like a cohort of PhD students who um, work like in neuroscience inspired engineering things. So we meet together, there are mechanical engineers in there, there are neuroscientists, like a white, and we just meet together and share ideas and talk about like what we're working on. Yeah, so I think, yeah, that, that's pretty much as, as detailed as I can go. I could, I could go about this the whole day if you give me the whole time. <laughs> oh, I'm sure your lab's so interdisciplinary. <laughs> I guess I'll also, mine's also um, pretty interdisciplinary. So I'll give like a, a quick, <laughs> I'm in virtual and augmented reality. We have applications everywhere. Um, so I, I've, I, early on in my grad career, I was kind of all over the place on projects. They'd be like, hey, Haley, put this data in VR. I'd be like, done, let's go. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it is in a somewhat similar way um, to James. I've, I've also 
um, worked a lot with like perceptual psychologists, co uh, people that work in cognitive development and vision science. Um, and then there's also this big subfield that I'm sure like I, Zach, from your description, I'm sure you can talk more into this with like the medical institutions. You'll find a lot of the labs here are based on medical imaging, like a shockingly large amount mm -hmm. of the CS labs. Um, so, for example, I am an affiliate of the Vanderbilt Institute of Surgical Engineering. I've presented on some, a couple of medical visualization projects. That's not my bread and butter, but it happens, you know? <laughs> um, and then I also personally, this is kind of like a plug in for the Center for Teaching. Um, so Vanderbilt has the Center for Teaching um, and it's, it's incredible. If you were interested in pedagogy, teaching, the arts and science of <laughs> teaching. Um, Vanderbilt has a lot of really great resources for tapping into that. Like I've worked a lot with the School of Science and Math. So you can work with high schoolers, undergrads, fellow grad students, a lot of options. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'll follow up with a little bit about my research. My re So ML is pretty interdisciplinary and has a lot of applications as well. Um, the, the area that I focus on is medical and neuroscientific data, as I mentioned before. Um, in undergrad, I also majored in neuroscience, so I came in and I took a computational neuroscience course. So when I started research, I knew I wanted to be um, applying machine learning to like brain MRI and stuff like that. Um, so I reached out to Professor Ipek Ogus, who is my discrete structures professor in my sophomore year, and I had like done a little bit of reading about her research. I was still like very novice. I didn't understand really what research was, how to do it. I didn't have a super great like grasp on ML either, other than this like one course that I take, uh, one course that I'd taken. Um, so I started working on uh, MRI harmonization using CycleGAN. Um, and CycleGAN is a generative adversarial network that, and the way I explain this to like the broad audiences is if you've ever heard of deep fakes, CycleGAN is basically the like model behind deep fakes. And not exactly, but if that's essentially what it does, where it takes one image and it tries to create a very convincing fake image in a different domain. Um, and that's really important for MRI for analytical scientific purposes. Um, and so on that, uh, with a postdoc who was a really great mentor for me and was definitely inspiring in my like wish to continue to pursue research. Um, shortly after starting that project, I, my advisor, uh, Professor Ogus, approached me with another project that was very neuroscientifically focused um, on a Huntington's disease data set. Um, and we basically just did a cortical surface analysis using like linear mixed models, which is a form of linear regression. Linear regression is the most basic form of machine learning. Um, so that's, and basically we just detected areas in the brain that are related to like cortical atrophy for Huntington's disease. And that project was really fun. Um, and it's one, it's, it's, it's getting submitted to brain right now. It's been a long time editing and really happy to see that one going through. Um, and then I, another project that I worked on, I started working on after, so right as I was applying to the master's program here in my final year of my senior year, or the second semester of my senior year, um, I started working on a project on uh, automatic segmentation using deep learning um, of, and like ureteroscopy videos of kidney stone surgery removal videos. Um, and I'm working with a uh, the UMC urologist or the medical uh, urologist in the medical center. Um, to, and that's, I'm actually doing my master's thesis on that now. Um, and it's also getting published in SPIE 2022 in February. Um, and so that project has been a lot of fun. Um, segmentation basically is you have a, an image and say there's a kidney stone in it and you put it through a machine learning model and then it outputs another image where that kidney stone or whatever, whatever you're trying to segment is colored in. It identifies every pixel that's, that's part of that class. Um, yeah, so I'm writing my thesis on an automatic segmentation system uh, for an endoscopic video segmentation. Um, yeah, so that's what, and I, my, my institute is, uh, so that's where I'm at right now, basically. And that's what I've been, you know, devoting a lot of my, life, my, my time to lately. Um, my institute is the Institute of Surgery and Robotics, or Sur Surgery and Engineering. Yeah. Um, it's very closely related to the medical center, and we do a lot of research with doctors. Um, and that's one great thing about Vandy is that if you want to do research that uh, helps healthcare, helps people, 
helps engineering in healthcare. Um, there's tons of opportunities to do that. And there's a lot of people that are really excited to work with you on that. Um, yeah, join Vise. <laughs> I can jump in. So uh, I mentioned that I work in cyber physical systems. So my research institute is the software for so Institute for Software Integrated Systems. And uh, my research specifically I've been working on for like the past year or so is uh, basically a method for detecting counterfeits. So uh, Zach mentioned kind of this, this model that creates deep fakes. Uh, a pretty pertinent issue today is uh, the creation of like counterfeit products. And uh, more specifically in supply chains like uh, aerospace and defense where uh, you know they're creating uh, these parts to go into very complex and large machines that uh, are going to do things in an environment where there could be uh, you know humans at risk um, and and kind of different things like that so my work is basically how can we guarantee that uh, some object that is is manufactured typically uh, the focus is on 3D printing or additive manufacturing. So there's a whole kind of suite of methods for uh, for doing that. But basically, how can we determine whether or not a object that was received along, you know, some long supply chain that was uh, spanning time and space, you know, you see these uh, global networks of shipping companies and and things where, um, you know, these these products can kind of get lost in translation. And um, so the, the method that we're developing is basically uh, a fingerprint that is kind of can be measured in real time and and detected to determine whether or not, uh, you know, some part that you've created and have shipped across uh, the ocean to another country uh, is the expected object, because there have been uh, kind of these incidents where uh, some kind of malicious actor is going to um, create maybe say like a fake fuel nozzle for a jet plane, and they're going to ship it across and uh, across the ocean, and there's no way to tell kind of whether or not it's authentic. Uh, so this is kind of interdisciplinary. Um, I guess it kind of is related to uh, we're collaborating with some mechanical engineers and also kind of some uh, material science people. Uh, but basically, the the method is a kind of replacement for the typical approach, which is kind of like barcodes and serial numbers um, or QR codes, which have been pretty popular in the pandemic. Um, it's it's actually kind of like a physical measurement where you can. Uh, connect this object to a special machine and and obtain what's called a piezoelectric or impedance signature and basically uh, take this fingerprint and compare it to uh, basically the the last fingerprint that uh, is kept uh, of that object so you can think of it as like a uh, you know like a smartphone has a touch id to measure your fingerprint this is kind of applying this method to uh, arbitrary manufactured objects Oh, you guys are so cool. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> um, I actually haven't gotten around to doing much research yet, um, as this is my first semester. But you can check back with me next year. I'll probably have a lot more to say because next year I'm writing a thesis. But um, just to prep for that, at least, because I know I have to do a little bit of research for art, like artificial um, AI and ethics. Uh, I've been just talking to my professors and just getting like advice and papers to read. So. Like I said, check back with me next year. I'll have more to say. All right, sounds wonderful. Um, and kind of on that topic, I also want to let everybody, you know, all of our viewers know that there's a lot of really exciting, you know, new initiatives going on within computer science at Vanderbilt. There's been a lot of growth going on recently. So Chancellor Derry Meyer, the new uh, chancellor uh, at Vanderbilt has put in a huge initiative um, to really grow out the computer science programs that we have, the computer science program rather that we have here. So in the past, computer science and electrical engineering were part of the same department. And as of recently, they're now their own separate department. So now electrical engineering is now the department of electrical and computer engineering. And now computer science has its own department. And we're actually in the process of um, um, recruiting 20 new faculty members to join the program. So just to give you an idea of the exponential growth in terms of just the program in general, there is a ton of, I mean, so in other words, it's a very exciting time to be in computer science at Vanderbilt right now. So I just wanted to also make sure to, that we just inserted that into the conversation as well. Um, so off of that, uh, I would like to go to our next question, which is, so tell us like, what is student life like at Vanderbilt? Like when it comes from, you know, like what's the, like, like a day in the life of a graduate student in computer science? Like, tell us a little bit about that. I feel like the younger Ooh. ones should go first, huh, James? 
<laughs> I'm on it. Okay, so <laughs> um, one of the my, one of the fun things about being a grad student at Vanderbilt is that um, I'm actually no longer living on campus. So during my undergrad, uh, pre-pandemic, I was living in dorms that were like super close to campus. So everything was like you know. Sometimes there's a lady who's cleaning everything for us. So all we have to do is like di our dishes and our laundry. We just have to cook for ourselves. So right now I actually live off campus in an apartment that I'm renting with a friend of mine. And I'm learning how to be an adult, which is like super cool. So um, my classes this semester were Tuesday, Thursday. So on Tuesday, I'd walk to campus. I live about a mile. So it's like a 20 minute walk and it's super, super fun. So like I'll just walk a mile to campus. I'll attend my classes. I'll chat with my friends and like, in between, you know, I'll have lunch. When I come home after my classes, um, you know, sometimes I'll hit the gym. We have a really, really nice gym. It's super fun to go to. But I'll either do that or I'll come home and then, you know, I'm working on my homework. Uh, one thing I do have Monday, Wednesday, Friday is that um, I do have an on-campus job. So I'll be there for like three or four hours, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then during that time, you know, I'm doing my office job. Um, after that, again, I'm doing my homework. Weekends are super fun. Weekends I'm doing homework, but sometimes, um, there's a lot of really great music places around Nashville. So there are times when I'll hit up my friends and I'll be like, hey guys, uh, there's a show going on at the Exit Inn, which is like super close. Why don't we all go there? Or, you know, I'll get brunch with the girls on a Saturday because uh, Biscuit Love is fantastic. And I will shout out all these places because they're so much fun. So it's kind of finding that balance between, um, you know, I'm going to class, I'm doing my homework. I may or may not have a campus job and then you know, but I feel like everyone else can kind of speak to the research aspect of this because you guys are part of lab. So what does that look like? <laughs> I think I'll go on from here. Um, I think my case has changed a lot, like pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. So I think pre-pandemic things were a lot different. I mean, yeah, I don't see you anymore, James. <laughs> yes, I don't see you. I used to see you all the time. So like we all in this big building, Fetheringo Hall, and like I head in in the mornings usually just sit in my lab and work throughout the day in the afternoon grab lunch occasionally i go and visit Haley in her lab because Haley Haley shares a wall with my advisor so when i have meetings with my advisor and i have to wait outside i just pop into Haley's lab and then we <laughs> have a talk or something yeah but yeah mainly it's class meetings and like just doing your research work but when the pandemic hits like I had to come home and over the past few, uh, should I say past two years, roughly, it's just been me sitting at home and just working from home almost every day. So not not much going out or like, and I live quite far from campus too. So it's, I, I don't really have any incentive going there anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's so nice, that, it's nice that we're all, it's nice that we're all in person, actually. We are wearing masks on campus. So yeah, mm -hmm. we do our best and, you know, whenever we're in classes, every or bring their mask and being safe but it's still so yeah. nice to just be around people again you know mm -hmm. yep it is it is yeah, yeah and james and i are also senior grad students at this point um so <laughs> a lot of our on-campus duties are like no longer we don't really have to yeah. be there as much anymore. no classes so I'm sure, no like, TAing. yes we're not TAing. i love TAing, but oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> um um, so Zach and Michael probably even have a, a very different experience from we've, what we've got. Um, we, so I've, I've been a similar way with James where I kind of like don't go in quite as much anymore. Um, sometimes I do still though, especially like the Vise Work Center is super nice. And sometimes I just need to get out of my house. <laughs> um, but other than that, um, yeah, work day. It's one pro tip for anyone considering grad school is um, set boundaries because it's really easy. You don't have to work necessarily a nine to five. And oftentimes your advisors actually work pretty late into night and they'll send you messages. Set boundaries, healthy work-life balance. <laughs> it's easy to slip out of it. Yeah, it can get stressful. It can. Yeah, I would, I would definitely uh, agree with that. Uh, last year was a lot of, like James said, kind of sitting inside, not really leaving the house, doing classes online. Um, but now I'm in my, I'm in my third and third semester of classes and this next semester in the spring will be my final semester of classes. So the end of my second year. And it's kind of like, uh, like we've kind of discussed basically 
you know, juggling class and then juggling meetings for research, uh, writing papers for research, reading papers to inspire new research, um, deadlines for conferences or different events, uh, kind of communicating with your advisor about upcoming things, uh, could be grant writing, basically, um, applying for funding to get money from some organizations to do uh, what you're interested in. Uh, but I definitely would uh, heed Haley's advice, which is to kind of set boundaries and also um, find kind of a schedule that works for you. Because I found that it was really easy to have your research kind of like consume you or kind of like, it's very easy to feel this immense pressure to just perform or like, it's like hard to um, maybe like, imagine what what you're ex what's expected of you so i think it's it's really uh it's really good to always seek feedback and also um kind of have a have a plan for for what you're interested in and kind of what you want to accomplish over a timeline and then kind of find a schedule that fits and then just hit the ground running i would say yeah, it goes by fast Goes That's great test. feedback. I'm glad you've realized that three semesters in, because I definitely realized it late and was super burned out. Um, <laughs> where heed Michael's advice. Yeah, I mean, I everybody else has kind of covered a lot of what it is like to be a grad student. You know, meetings, doing a lot of research. The great thing about being in computer science is a lot of it you can do remotely. You don't have to have a bench and do wet lab work, so you can work from wherever. Um, my days typically look like I go to the gym in the morning, I get ready to go to class, go to class, and then I go to the lab right after class and I work for a while. Um, lately, I have not been going to the lab. Um, I've just been staying at home and trying to get my fellowship applications and PhD applications done, um, and also the million other deadlines for like paper submissions and stuff like that that are going on right now. Um, working on you know just trying to get trying to get everything done basically grad student life has is this is probably the busiest i've ever been like having been an undergrad at vandy it was never like this um and it can be it it can be overwhelming but like Haley said set boundaries uh i'm like a, i i'm i i work hard during the week and i play hard during the weekend um <laughs> definitely have work-life balance like enjoy your life while you're in grad school and don't let it mm -hmm. consume you um and yeah, that's that's my suggestions. And that's that's what campus life is like for me right now, so. Silver lining moment, guys. When you finish coursework and you may or may not be on TA right now, but if you also are not on TA, things slow down a lot. Very. <laughs> we'll have time to sleep and things. <laughs> All right, no, well, thanks, thanks for that really exciting insight. Um, and kind of on that topic, um tell us a little bit like about the city of nashville in general like what are your like your go-to places in nashville when it comes to just the city in general um and then like right as you're about to answer that question i just want to remind our viewers please feel free to send us your questions if you have any we're fielding questions so please feel free to send them out um and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible um so yes nashville tell us a little bit about the city not downtown <laughs> Second. Second that. No, I thought it was touristy. Really like fun. it's really touristy. It, so. Yeah, no, they're they're right. You guys are right. Um, <laughs> one thing that I like to do whenever I'm going to a new city. So I'm from Southern California, and when I was applying to different schools, I was like Nashville. I wanted to go a couple of years ago. Let me see what's actually going on there. So I watched like a bunch of videos and I tried to find out, you know, what are the really fun things? So fun things to do around Nashville, if you're not going to go downtown, um, Tennessee State Museum is actually uh, just off downtown. It's a really nice place. I've yet to go, but I really do want to. Right next to the Tennessee State Museum, we have the farmer's market uh -huh. uh, that happens every day. You got some like local people are coming in selling their goods, but then they also have like a little cafeteria style thing, which is super fun. There's a lot of really cool music venues that you can check out. Um, I did mention one a little bit earlier, the Exit Inn. Um, I mentioned it because I walk by like all the time. Um, lots of really great eateries. Hattie B's is of course like a really famous one. Uh, Prince's is another one that's super famous for uh, their natural hot chicken. See, Haley's just like, yes, Prince is okay. Now we have to go because um, I haven't been yet. I kind of have to. I will say I have not had bad chicken 
since I've been here. So uh, I'm just saying, guys, the food here is amazing. So, um, yeah. And then sometimes just walking around campus, you know, our campus is just so beautiful, especially, oh, my gosh, during the fall mm-hmm. when the trees are changing colors. And it was just red and orange and green. And, oh, my gosh, it was absolutely lovely. So nice to walk around. But, yeah, that, that's, that's a couple of things I'll just throw out there, you know. Mm. Yeah, I think I think you're right about the Tennessee State Museum. I've been there several times. It's like it's yeah, I've been there several times. So I have two little kids. So they do have like um programs for children, like story times, and so I do get emails from them all the time if they're having this. Then I take my kids there. And they also have a spray ground right next to it. So I don't know if they open like they didn't open it this summer, but most summers is open and they just have water gushing out of the ground and you can just go stand in there and have fun. <laughs> and then uh, oh. yes, I think also one thing I like most about Nashville are the thrift stores. Like there's so many thrift stores here in Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> and those are very wait. cool stuff. Yeah, like wait, really have cool you been stuff. to Plato's Closet? Have I been to Plato's Closet? Well, so they are they are more into clothes. I like collecting like cameras and oh, gadgets okay. and electronics. So I don't <laughs> yeah, but there's also oh, a very yeah. big flea market. It's like one of the largest flea markets in America. It, it runs like ev- at the end of every month. It's at the fairground, like the whole fairground is taken up. And yeah, there's a lot of music and the food is really good. Like the food is really, really good. <laughs> yeah, so um but the, although they say don't go to downtown, I also do like going to downtown sometimes. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I, I do great, like, like once or twice a year. Yeah, but yeah, I yeah. never. I know some people that go there like every weekend, and I it's, it's no, that, that would that would, like, that would definitely. Oh, that one an farm, and they just shook it really hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I'll jump in and say that. Uh, I guess I guess some of you guys have been here for a few years, but it's changed a lot uh, since my undergrad kind of the downtown area which i guess from from one perspective it might be considered a lot more it definitely is a lot more crowded now but it's just a sign of growth in nashville which uh i think that's pretty evident uh, all around campus and and kind of around the greater downtown area um i also like the frist art museum which is maybe technically considered close to downtown or in the gulch area they do a, a frist mm-hmm. friday or they at least last i checked they they did that where I think college students get like a discounted uh, ticket price and they, they kind of have some really interesting exhibits uh, throughout the year. So I like to go and walk around there. And there are also uh, a bunch of different breweries that I like. Uh, like, I guess there's Jackalope, um, Von Elrod's, a couple different places to try different types of beer. And then I like, I mean, I, I think I've said this before, but I like all the different neighborhoods, like kind of personalities. Like you have East Nashville, Sylvan Park, Germantown, uh, and so they're all kind of just waiting for you to like explore. They all have kind of like their own unique character and, and like really cool like food and drink. So there's a lot of that. And then uh, plenty of parks as well, like Percy Priest and Percy Warner. Nice for like a weekend hike to get away from school things. Wait, you said park. We forgot Centennial Park. It's literally right across the street. <laughs> if you're a fan of Greek mythology, uh, there is a reconstruction of the Parthenon, like a one-to-one scale of model of the Parthenon that has the Athena Parthenos inside. Mm-hmm. So it is very cool. And it's right across the street from Vanderbilt. So, so yeah. Yeah, I would say like it, there's um, even during the pandemic, um, could, like the, the bar scene's always been popping in Nashville. Um, but um, just the weather in Nashville is also really nice. Um, if you're not familiar with extreme heat, the summers, like there's a few months there that might be a little gnarly. Um, but all in all, I'd say the weather's actually really swell. Mm-hmm. Um, you also like there are there is there's like two rainy seasons in the fall and spring where you get like nuts weather. Um, but honestly, I kind of like it. It's you don't get like misty skies and haze all the time. Mm-hmm. If it rains, it's gonna rain. Yeah, it's gonna pour. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, even when when we were all quarantining, I remember going to the lake all the time. There's there's a nearby lake. What is it's not Percy Priest Lake? Percy Priest, yeah. No, mm-hmm. I'm drawing a blank. We went there a lot. <laughs> Um, and you could like go river rafting on the rivers. There's there's a lot of activities you could do um, outside of the city too, which is nice. Yeah. I think if you just drive about, because like it's right in the middle of Tennessee, 
Like if you drive just about two hours, one to two hours out of town, you can get to so many interesting places. Oh yeah, if you're willing and, like, to drive, there's a bag lot. And um, like, that's so many interesting things you can get to. Pigeon Forge. Good. Oh yeah. 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 Good rock uh, climbing in Chattanooga. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not too far. Even just within Good Nashville. Trip. Like, yeah. Like, even within Nashville, if you don't have a car, like I don't have a car, but just walking everywhere is actually yeah. super simple. So that's actually yeah. a really good point. Nashville's a city where I feel like I can walk places. Um, I used to go to undergrad in Memphis, Tennessee. You you did not walk. <laughs> <laughs> It is, it is a very high murder rate. Um, Nashville does not. <laughs> yeah. But I think if you live out of town, you definitely need a car. Yeah, like, no, that's true. If you live out of town, because everything outside of the main downtown Nashville, like campus area, once you move a little bit out, everything is so spread out. It's just like highways all over the place. <laughs> and James, so full disclosure, James used to live like, I and mean, you might still live out there, like near the airport ish. Um, I and you would take a bus to campus. Yeah. It would take what, 45 minutes? Yeah, it used to take 40 minutes. Oh. Yeah, 40 to 45 minutes to get to campus from where I was living. So oh, the bus goes downtown, and then I have to change over downtown and then move over to campus. But it was good reading time, like just sitting in the bus and read. <laughs> My commute is seven minutes on the bus. <laughs> oh, and the bus is free for Vanderbilt students. I think I should throw that out. Oh, yeah. That is very nice. Yeah, you free. can ride the it bus goes, for free. There's a bus that goes um, right next to campus that goes downtown, and it goes to Midtown, where like a lot of nice grocery stores and a mall is. Love that bus. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice. You just swipe your ID card. Did we forget anything? I mean, there's a lot. You just have to come and explore. <laughs> yeah, it does feel like there's always something going on. Um, used to go to like Halloween balls and like re re a prohibition day, repeal day celebrations. You dress up like it's 20s. There's there's always something going on. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, there's a church very close to campus that has line dancing Tuesday evenings. Yeah, yeah. Those this um, undergrad in my lab, Josh. We used to take us out there. Like he do everywhere. Yeah, Josh was really cool. <laughs> he was the really tall guy, a little eccentric. Yeah, with the green hair. Very endearing. Yeah, he used to take us out to the light. It was fun. Yes, and I think also is is neat to mention, especially for students looking to go into computer science, Vanderbilt. Uh, Nashville, rather, is one of the like new upcoming IT cities in the US right now. So it's actually become a central IT point for anybody that wants to go into IT companies like Amazon, you know, their center, their uh, center of excellence is moving here. They're going to create 5,000 new jobs in the city. Oracle just announced they're going to be building a campus here, 8,500 new jobs that will be established here. So there's, I think in terms of opportunity, and then of course, future opportunities within the IT sector for so in terms of like, you know, companies here, industry, people looking to go into industry, having those resources right in the same city where you're studying is going to be really lucrative as well. Um, so you have a lot of really cool companies moving into the city. Um, so yes. Um, oh, I, I do see we do have a question from a student. So I'm just going to jump in real quick. Um, so the question is, um, what is the most common departmental norm for PhD students at Vanderbilt? What kind of norm? So I guess maybe like department culture, like departmental mm. norm for PhD students. Kind of hard to tell. I, I would say that the department as a whole is actually pretty decentralized. There seems to be these affiliations by lab groups, but I remember mm -hmm. um, someone told me that like this was some years ago, there was 200 people in our department. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> no way. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like that now where like every time I hear how many PhD students are, it's like a shock to me, like one way or the other. But definitely, um, <laughs> there's there's like different nuclei of of labs, and like some students are friends from other labs or collaborate in other labs. Um, but I mean, I think, or I'd like to think you kind of have autonomy in terms of how you want to conduct things. Obviously, like 
subject to your, your advisor's approval. I know um, my lab group is is just four of us right now, and we're moving into the Sony building. So our advisor kind of has, has given us uh, freedom to you know make that space our own. Uh, we go out to dinner sometimes. Um, we go out hiking with another lab mate. Uh, I guess it, it does just kind of depend, but um, you could have friends that you only talk to talk about uh, research with or friends that you do both or, um, you know, just there's a lot of different ways to meet uh, people and a lot of people are doing really interesting things. All right. All right. Great point. Um, and so, so thank you very much for the question. Um, and then just kind of jumping back to the whole like Nashville topic real quick. Um, you may also like for the viewers out there may also know that. So Nissan's North America headquarters are also here in the city. So F FYI, we're talking about job opportunities. That's another really great resource. Um, so this is going to most likely be the last question because, because I see how we have five minutes left. Um, so you know, with a computer science degree, whether it be, you know, you're graduating with a master's degree or PhD degree, there's so many different types of opportunities when it comes to employment. Um, some people may want to go into academia, others may want to go into industry, you know, there's so much out there. So what are you personally thinking about doing after you graduate? I think for me, it's 90% faculty, maybe 10% industry, depending on how it goes. Because I've I've had quite some industry experience already. And my main motivation for coming to graduate school was faculty work. So yeah, um, for me, it's faculty work. I enjoy it. And yeah, yeah I, I came into grad school, all, a very similar mode of thought with, um, with James, where right? I really wanted to go stay in academia and be a professor. At this point, I am more wishy-washy on it. Um, I, I certainly see the appeal of doing industry. Um, and so I, I think it's important for at some point in your grad school career, if you, for example, haven't had industry experience prior to do an internship. Um, like I did an internship with PlayStation's research lab one summer, which was nuts. Um, and then I've, I've recently gotten funding from Microsoft for a project. And these are both industry appeal, like appeals that I'm like, oh, what if they give me more money to do more? <laughs> oh. um, and it's okay to not know exactly. There's, um, I actually know even professors that actually decide during the application process, they're like, whatever works is gonna work. Um, which is a kind of vague answer on my end, but both sound fun for me. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, starting out, I definitely had that in the back of my mind, considering maybe um, being open to some kind of faculty opportunity. And like Haley said, that can definitely change kind of as you move through your program and obviously your mileage will vary, but basically you kind of see the different responsibilities that faculty members have and kind of all the things that they're involved with, how busy they can get. Uh, but it really comes down to kind of what you're looking for. Um, like on the one hand in industry, um, maybe obviously a little bit more lucrative and um, maybe a little bit um, more time to yourself, I guess. But kind of on the other hand, um, you kind of in academia, you trade that for um, like autonomy to basically learn what you want to learn um, figure out problems that are interesting to you, uh, learning how to learn and how to fail, and then um, just collaborating and meeting uh, really interesting people. Uh, so for me, I would say I'm still probably kind of a split, maybe like 60-40 industry to uh, maybe academia. I have a pretty long way to go though, so that can change. But um, I think definitely coming to grad school, be receptive to, to kind of both and um, maybe not try to like push one one way or the other, especially early on, depending on what your goals are. Yeah, for me, I don't really know yet. Uh, I think I'll know a little bit more once I'm in my PhD writing. As I'm writing my dissertation, I'll probably have a better idea. But that's still years away. Um, I guess I'm considering both options in a way, but I have heard, you know, being in computer science, being an ML, there's a lot of money and I would like to see that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we'll see what happens in five years for me. Um, for me, 
once I get my master's, my plan is to work for a couple of years and then come back and get my PhD. Uh, that's where I'm at right now. Um, my friends have told me I'd be a great professor. I'm not sure if that's what I wanna do just yet, but my short-term plan is work for a little while and then get my PhD. Oh, and there's also an important thing to note because I feel like a lot of people don't actually know this, but I guess probably the people who are watching this video have probably already done the legwork. But uh, when you do a PhD, you get paid. Um, now, if you have a lot of uh, a debt, you don't get paid a lot, um, but you do get paid. And that is actually one thing I would say Vanderbilt does really well with. Um, of the schools I apply to, cost of living versus what they pay, Vanderbilt was very good. Mm -hmm. um, there's some notorious schools that are not so good. So make sure you do your research. Um, I had a friend at USC and I was like, how not, USC is a great program, but I was, I don't understand how they afforded to live. It was like 26,000 <laughs> a year in California. And I was like, I earn what 5,000 more in engineering at Vanderbilt and the cost of living is a fraction. Yes, lower, definitely. Um, so be careful of that when you apply. There's a lot yeah, of things so that when you're applying to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of things that you want to keep in mind, whether you're applying to a master's or a PhD program. Like Haley said, you know, for the PhD program, are they going to pay you to do your PhD? Because a lot of schools will do that. Vanderbilt, I think, does that. So it's like, kind of keep your eyes on the prize right there. So the master's program is kind of like, you know, what schools have the best kind of things that I want to study, you know? So definitely do your research. Always do your research. Yes, no, it's it's, uh, it's really that's something about the PhD program, it being fully funded. And you're right. Also, Haley, Vanderbilt does provide a decent stipend. It's thirty one thousand dollars a year, which given the cost of living in Nashville, it's I think it's, it's pretty decent. Um, so students do tend to live comfortably on it. Well, that is all the time for today. Um, but I do want to say thank you all for coming out, for talking with our with with with, with the listeners today. Um, and yeah, uh, this has been a really exciting session. I'm really glad we did it. Um, and uh, we will definitely, you know, we'll, we'll all be in contact. And thank you for the viewers for joining us as well. Um, Take care and stay safe and we'll talk soon, okay?